Major Earl C. Carlson, and we were stationed, uh, my unit was, I was an Air Base Commander. At, what year? Uh, in 1968, just before the Great Invasion or uh, War of Tet started. And when the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese had infiltrated down into the south and started the war to take me to force Americans out of Vietnam. This is the end of 1968. And uh, I was an air base commander and had uh, part of my units uh, were uh, up on Song Bay Mountain, uh, just about 100 miles northeast of uh, Saigon. And we were up there to take uh, Special Forces soldiers out along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and capture stragglers and take them in and question them to try to find out who was coming in and how many and where they were going and what equipment they had and what their instructions were. Uh, it was a very difficult and, and uh, very powerful movement we were involved in and the Special Forces troops that we were carrying out there were taking great risks completely out on their own. Coming back from one of the missions just before Tet, uh, we, I got an emergency call from uh, the headquarters in Saigon to bring all of our aircraft back immediately to the Saigon, to our base, to my base there. And it was uh, a little chilling because we knew that thousands of, Vietnam, of uh, North Vietnamese soldiers were infiltrating down into South Vietnam. So we knew the attack was imminent. Got down there in the evening of uh, before Tet and uh, went out to check my defenses to make sure everybody knew what they were doing and that we were well defended. And uh, when I was satisfied, I went back and you know, I was late, I was very tired, so I went to bed. And a couple of hours later, they came and awakened me and said, we have lost a helicopter. I said, how could that be? That, uh, I thought all the aircraft were here and secure. They said, well, we were, but the um, uh, commanding of the, our parent unit wanted to borrow an aircraft because they were fully engaged in taking some of our soldiers over to an area where the North Vietnamese Army soldiers and VC were collecting, preparing for a, 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 an invasion, apparently, of the Saigon area. Uh, and so uh, when they came in, they said, one of our aircraft has crashed. I couldn't believe it because I thought we had all of our aircraft back and that's when they told me that they had a limp one of our aircraft and it had crashed in the area that the, uh, had, where they had gone taking troops in to fight the Vietnamese from North Vietnam. Uh, there had been a firefight and it had set trees on fire and our helicopter uh, taking off with all of the ashes that were on the ground there, wound up uh, blinding the uh, pilot and their water hit the one of the trees apparently and uh, the aircraft fell to the ground and turned upside down. And so we, uh, we could see them from a distance that it was an eerie sight to see that poor helicopter upside down and, and what looked to be like a snow field. I had gotten my best pilot and uh, had to fly co-pilot for me and so we made an approach very cautious and it was difficult because we became blinded as soon as our uh, rotors began to churn up the ashes. So we went in cautiously and I told my co-pilot to pay attention carefully to how we approached that because he had less experience than I had in that sort of operation. And it wasn't like bringing an airliner into a, an air base where you have radar that traces every second. It's sort of flying by the seat of your pants. So we came, got in, got there safely. And so I told my crew chief to get his. And, but first of all, the, we heard this eerie sound. It was, it was weird, was somewhere between a scream and a moan. And I realized that Skinner was underneath the aircraft and was trapped and had been there unconscious for hours. Uh, I said, the chill up my back. Yeah, really, it did. And so uh, I told my co pilot to get up, uh, to take the aircraft up and get away from that area so we weren't marking that for any VC that may still remain in that area and who may come back to re attack us. So he went out away from there and loitered, waiting for us to give him a radio signal to come back. We went over to the helicopter and with a long tail, we were able to. Uh, lift up the rear end enough to get uh, uh, 
a specialist scanner out from underneath the aircraft, the helicopter. And we brought him out and called radio, called a, a pilot to come, my co-pilot, to come back and pick us up. Uh, we put him in the back uh, floor of the helicopter and badly imaged, uh, injured. It was his uh, hip and his leg that uh, were badly manic, bashed. Uh, he was went through periods of consciousness and unconsciousness. It must have been extremely painful for him. We flew him directly to the field hospital and uh, left him there. And I asked the, uh, the ambulance driver where they were taking him. And it was there at the hospital. And he said, uh, it looks like we have to take him to the uh, uh, amputation ward. Uh, but we knew an invasion was imminent, so we went back to our home base and told the uh, doctor uh, when he allowed to that we would be back to sea when the next day. And so uh, when I got back to the base immediately, I went around and checked all of our outposts to make sure they were uh, okay. We were getting sniper fire already, and, uh, but that was punctuated by heavy machine gun fire. I realized that the troops out there as snipers wouldn't have a, a 50 caliber machine gun. So I called the hospital, which was about a half a mile away from us, and asked them if they were firing a 50 caliber machine gun. And they said yes they were because there were snipers out in the area, which was between the two bases. But those are the uncertainties you have in combat. You, you never know quite what was happening, what's going to happen. Well, can I, can I back up just a minute? When you said that you had found out that the person was under, that, that your person was under the, or had been left behind, what specifically did you say or think before you went back to get him? Well, oh, of course, my first impression was, how could you go off and leave him? And that's before I found out that the pilot, the co-pilot, had been thrust through the, uh, uh, the you know, the uh, windshield mm -hmm. and were badly damaged. So they didn't know that he was caught underneath the helicopter, and so they went off with the other uh, aircraft. And it says one of them stayed behind to take them back. And it wasn't until they got back to base that I found out that they were left him for dead. And of course, I said, you cannot do that for heaven's sake. He's one of us. He's some mother's son. I mean, you don't go off and leave somebody in the battlefield. Get my helicopter ready. We're going out. We're going after him. He's badly injured, and you've got, this, you've got this, this gunfire going on between the two bases. So then what? Then I went back to my base to make sure that everything was ready and that uh, the people weren't getting spooked out by the sniper fire. Uh, called the Air Force and asked them to uh, uh, send them fire bombers uh, in there to uh, fire bomb the area between the two areas. So any snipers in there would be uh, at least have to go under cover. Uh, the next day I went back to the hospital and uh, a Special Skinner was no longer there. They had sent him back and he, they had taken him out of the uh, uh, amputation ward. Mm -hmm. And I assumed that they, had they couldn't amputate him there that they sent him back to the States for the amputation. This is 1968. And this is 1968. And this was a shock to me, but, uh, you know, it's combat. So I'd been there once before in, in Vietnam as a Special Forces character. Uh, I, I never saw Special Skinner again. I, I didn't know whether he had died there or what happened. But by happenstance, I was on the computer years later. What? what ten years what, later. Ten years, okay. About ten years later, and I saw the 195th, uh, that was my, the name of my unit, had a site on the uh, computer, and I went there. And uh, I started, uh, I, I then got in contact with some people, then I got a telephone number, and I called up a number of them who were there waiting for my call. Because we were very close knit, we really were. All of us enlisted in officers together, and while we were discussing it, uh, I wondered what if they had knew what happened, and I'd forgotten his name by then because you know I had hundreds of people there, and uh, so they kept asking questions, and I kept asking questions, and they kept giving me funny answers. But one guy in particular was interested, and uh, uh, and I 
I was trying to explain to him that, uh, that one of the guys in the unit uh, had had a bad accident and, uh, and was taken to the amputation ward, which is where we left him in Vietnam the last time I saw him. And pretty soon we put the pieces together, and that was Skinner, for heaven's sake. And Skinner uh, then was just uh, taken back by it all. And he was not uh, dead, and he was not amputated, but he had to get an artificial round and had reconstructed his life, uh, had a good job, and uh, life was much, much, much better than I had ever dreamed he had.